thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pascal, for that warm introduction. Uh, you know, uh, I will continue my lecture. Uh, you know, as I mentioned in the morning lecture, uh, high fiscal deficit has no fiscal cost. Uh, you know, if it can be, uh, you know, substantiated with increased public investment or output gap reduction. Uh, and you know, when monetary policy stance has limitations in triggering growth uh, through liquidity infusion and also by changing the rates or keeping the policy rate status quo, it is the fiscal dominance that is crucial for a sustained growth recovery. Because we have seen that uh, you know, there are global challenges to keep the interest rate at status quo. Uh, because in the recent Jackson Hole Economic Symposium and, you know, the Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC meetings, um, you know, U.S. Fed Chair uh, Jay Powell has specified that there is a likelihood of tightening, uh, you know, U.S. monetary policy by reducing the balance sheet of Fed and also through a possible hike in the policy rate by early 2022. And these, of course, will have repercussions for the rest of the world, especially in an emerging economy like India. And we have to think about tightening you know, our rates or you know, increasing our interest rates. Uh, but uh, you know, RB has not uh, you know, chosen to be hawkish yet because of the domestic growth concerns. But given you know, the inflation, one moment, <coughs> Yes, given the inflation figures that came up yesterday, the WPI inflation crossing 14% and even our CPI nearing 5%, you know, there are concerns for increasing the interest rate in India. <coughs> and this divergence between the wholesale price index and the consumer price index, that is also a matter of huge concern. So maybe in the February Monetary Policy Committee meeting, there may be an announcement for increasing the interest rate. But why we are not doing that? Why we have not increased the interest rate so far? Because you know we have growth concerns in the sense, uh, credit deployment or the loans uh, you know, liquidity infusion was a major narrative of the economic stimulus package against the backdrop of pandemic in India. So it's like you are providing credit cheap to the business community to engage in economic activity, which in turn can lead to a growth upturn. So uh, they expect their loans to be cheaper. They expect their credit to be cheaper so that, you know, investment can be triggered. But at the same time, the moment you look at the financialization of savings, you know, this decreasing rates of interest, that's a matter of huge concern. And if you look at the rate of interest in real terms, that is our CPI inflation is reaching 4 to 5 percent and the, uh, you know, interest rate is 4 percent. That means are we getting into the negative quadrant of the real rate of interest? These are matter of huge concern. So pressure is mounting on RBI to move away from its accommodative stance, uh, not only due to this taper tantrum, which I mentioned, also due to the soaring commodity prices and the energy prices, which are reflected, uh, you know, in the uh, yesterday's estimates of, you know, the WPI inflation, which is cross 14%. And, uh, you know, the way center governments or the center banks, they have defended that uh, these inflationary pressures they treat these inflationary pressures as transitory and you know it is attributing uh, to the supply chain disruption so once we deal with that uh, you know this transitory inflationary pressures will go off so these are the ways in which center bank defend that this increase in inflation is not a matter of concern but today or tomorrow we have to take that hard decision of increasing the interest rate and right now uh, we didn't go for a normalization procedure. Normalization procedure in the sense, we have announced a lot of economic stimulus programs and now it's a time to roll up those programs. You know, we cannot uh, 
uh, go on infinitely with the economic stimulus programs but are we ready to do that can we do that without economic growth recovery that's why you know there are certain measures taken up by rbi but not as official npc meetings announcement of you know changing the policy rates but informally they are you know taking steps towards normalization procedure in the sense you know rbi challenges that go beyond this repo rate decision because you know if you look into the economic stimulus packages rbi had also engaged in an emergency bond purchase program to infuse the liquidity to the economy and also it has not announced uh, you know any peculiar liquidity or normalization procedure but we have seen from the last npc meetings that they rbi abstained from announcing further you know government security acquisition programs and another major decision taken by rbi to absorb that excess liquidity was to tweak the monetary policy corridor in the sense that the pre, the space between your repo rate reverse repo rate and the upper bound of overnight marginal lending facility that needs to be tightened but that tightening of the corridor uh, you know that 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 may reverse the nudging rbi has been engaging in uh, like you know they tweak this reverse repo rate to help the pandemic hit economy in the sense that the commercial banks will go for a uh, you know huge uh, credit deployment but that was not happening in spite of all these nudging processes you know you can see that the banks prefer to keep their you know liquidity back with the rbi in the reverse repo rate so uh, but you can see there is no official announcement towards an upward revision of the repo rate all you can see is that limited calibration that had happened with regard to the cutoff yield rate of the variable rate reverse repo that is that is what we call as v triple r that rate has been increased to 3.99% but that was not officially announced so officially rbi has chosen to remain accommodative rather than moving towards a neutral stance so these are the informal ways it is not a you know strict normalization procedure that was announced by rbi to move away from the economic stimulus packages they have announced now the foreign exchange reserve is mounting uh, you know that is also infusing the liquidity into the economy that is increasing the hyperward money into the system and rbi has engaged in operation twist uh, in the sense that methodology is to simultaneously buying and selling the bonds to postpone the refinancing risk in the sense they go for simultaneous buying of long term and selling of short term bonds to postpone this refinancing risk and that's a strategy uh, you know to deal with the refinancing risk to infuse the liquidity and that is also a part of the monetary stimulus package uh, you know to tackle the pandemic so there are concerns about the delay in the policy normalization process in the financial markets because you know primarily uh, we have seen the repercussions of the policy rates on this call money market operations because our overnight call money market rates are now below the policy rate it's around 3% when the policy rate is 4% so another concern is the impact of this liquidity in the possibility of fueling bad credit itself so rbi is grappling with all these multiple challenges and the global macroeconomic challenges also triggering a kind of capital flight the moment you know if fed reserve or in the fomc meetings in us if they go for increasing the interest rate so there are multiple challenges inflationary pressures we have uneven economic recovery the the the, the you know what you, what you call the fear of triggering a capital flight you know in this context there's a policy dilemma whether to go ahead with increasing rates or not so so far what we thought that the rates have to be maintained status quo because growth first that is a narrative which was you know supported by rbi but right now a fiscal policy monetary policy coordination is very crucial and a rate maneuvering towards you know increasing the uh, what you call the interest rate that is very crucial because normalization you know that pressure 
is happening quite a huge uh, you know it is a huge pressure regarding the global headwinds and the inflationary pressures we have seen in the yesterday's estimate you know it's above 14 percent of course it is wpi rbi is concerned about the cpi because there is a difference between wpi and cpi inflation wpi is like you know it's a wholesale uh, price inflation but cpi is you know it, what the consumers feel and if you look at the baskets you know this wpi inflation deals with only the goods but cpi it looks into the service related aspects of the price and uh, also the uh, you know the uh, goods and if you look at the uh, base year you know yesterday's that 14.1% you have to read that the base year was 2011 but the WPI, the base year is recent, you know. So these are the differences. The package, the basket is different. Uh, you know, the domain is different. The base year is different. Uh, and uh, in this decision-making process, which, uh, you know, inflation-related index that RBI is concerned, you know, by mandate, RBI is supposed to look into the price inflation based on CPI. And the price stability is the sole function of RBI. And uh, they have, by that agreement between the Ministry of Finance and RBI, that has happened five years back. And also, it is revised now to keep inflation under control as the major mandate of RBI. So, given these uncertainties with the RBI, monetary policy, fiscal policy coordination is crucial. And fiscal policy has got a major role to play in the growth recovery process. That's why the narrative that high fiscal deficit has no fiscal cost you know the narrative that high fiscal deficit is good in the time of pandemic and when we talk about the deficit it is not only the levels of deficit that matter how you finance your deficit that is also a equally a matter of concern so high fiscal deficit has no fiscal cost if it can be substantiated with increased public investment or output gap reduction and uh, you know these are extraordinary times and we require those extraordinary policy responses and if you look at the fiscal deficit of GDP it is as high as 9.5 percent uh, you know in the revised estimates in 2020-21 budget union budget and this is against the pegged deficit of 3.5 percent in the budget estimate uh, you know in 2021 but of course this is not signaling any fiscal profligacy because finance minister has announced an excessive deficit procedure path that roadmap to bring down the high fiscal deficit to 4.5 percent of gdp in the financial year 2026 so the normalization procedure in uh, you know in the fiscal policy front that is postponed to 2026 and uh, you know why the high fiscal deficit is perceived as detrimental to economy there are three schools of thought regarding high fiscal deficit and you know one school of thought believe we call them neo classicals you know they believe that fiscal deficit is detrimental to the economy because it can lead to uh, you know crowding out of private capital formation and it can lead to you know financial crowding out in the sense uh, the loanable uh, funds in the market that is limited so if you preempt uh, the loanable funds uh, to finance your deficit what is available for the private uh, you know sector private corporate sector that's coming down and that can increase that can shoot up the interest rates that's the argument of you know this crowding out but empirical studies have proved in the context of emerging economies like india it is not crowding out it is crowding in if you use the fiscal deficit correct in the sense if you use that fiscal deficit to enhance the capital spending capital infrastructure that can crowd in private investment now comes the question of fiscal rules uh, you know our fiscal space is constrained by fiscal rules so is there any fundamental rethinking about the efficacy of the fiscal rules in the sense we need to you know stick on to a numeric threshold ratio of deficit to gdp at three percent in the time of pandemic is it growth enhancing in nature because if the path to fiscal consolidation 
is through expenditure compression rather than increased tax buoyancy then the quality of fiscal consolidation itself gets affected that's exactly what is a narrative you know in the chapter 2 of economic survey 2021 you can take a look into that chapter 2 in the economic survey 2021 that talks about the public debt sustainability and krishna and his team professor krishna the chief economic advisor and his team uh, in the chapter 2 highlighted that the perspective uh, of you know if you have the high interest rate uh, you know uh, and that interest rate if it is less than the growth rate then you know intertemporal budget can strain facing the government no longer buying so this is exactly the argument put forward by eminent macro economist oliver blanche as well and he has uh, you know spoken about this even prior to pandemic uh, you know if you listen in the web uh, to his uh, presidential address in the american economic association conference in atlanta in 2019 january i was there to present my paper in the american economic association so it was my privilege to listen to him uh, you know in the last slide of his presentation what he highlighted was that you know public debt may not be good uh, but it is not bad at all if you use it correct if you use it for enhancing public debt a public uh, you know investment and if you use it for reducing the output gap you know sectoral productivity if you can enhance using the high fiscal deficit then the narrative that fiscal deficit is good that's why you know there are differences in the way we respond to two crises like the way we responded to global financial crisis and the way we are responding to the pandemic crisis you know after the global financial crisis in the macro economic policy tool the predominantly we used was monetary policy tool but if you look at the efficacy or the effectiveness of the monetary policy tool you know the when the interest rate was going zero bound when it was going even negative then we understood the limitations of using monetary policy as a counter cyclical policy tool to deal with a crisis but right now of course with these narratives that deficit is not bad in the time of pandemic we are you know giving emphasis to fiscal dominance we are giving em- emphasis to fiscal policy uh, as an important tool uh, you know to deal with the crisis and you can take a look into that uh, you know uh, his speech uh, in the american economic association conference it's there in the aa website Uh, or even you can take a look into the american economic review that uh, that was published in the american economic review as well it explained that public debt has no fiscal cost if the real rate of interest is not greater than the real rate of growth of the economy so it was also highlighted that high public debt is not catastrophic if more debt can be justified by clear benefits like public investment or output gap reduction and that analysis was on the basis of hysteresis framework hysteresis effects in the sense the persistent impact of the short term fluctuations on the long term you know potential output here what is suggested is that a temporary fiscal expansion is good a temporary fiscal expansion during a contractionary period that could even reduce public debt on a longer horizon so these are the perspectives incorporated in the economic survey 2021 especially in that chapter 2 when they dealt with analyzing the debt deficit dynamics now let's go for an anatomy of this high fiscal deficit number uh, in union budget 2021 i mentioned that in the revised estimates we have seen a budget deficit a fiscal deficit to gdp at 9.5% of course it is not alone the new expenditure priorities that has happened to deal with the pandemic it is a combination of revenue shortfall new expenditure priorities and also it's a kind of strengthening budget transparency in the sense we have incorporated the prior of budget borrowing also into this uh, you know deficit number that also led to the rise in this deficit number in in the sense the food corporation of india fci is borrowing from the national small savings fund you know that is stopped and now it's a part of fiscal deficit 
earlier you know it was kept outside the purview of the fiscal deficit now to bring in more budget transparency you know that is incorporated and that's why you can see that you know uh, a part of deficit you know that is going up like 9.5% uh, and um, the existing fiscal rules uh, you know that were also amended to incorporate the revised threshold of that deficit to GDP in the sense uh, in the 2004 the original fiscal rules that was framed in uh, in India there was a golden rule and what is a golden rule golden rule means we need to keep zero revenue deficit what does it mean uh, you know how we can eliminate revenue deficit and uh, you know if you look into the clauses of this illumination of the uh, you know revenue deficit you can see that uh, what exactly is this in simple terms all what you earn in terms of your revenue receipts you use it for financing revenue spending nothing more than that so that your revenue receipts will be equal to revenue spending that's why the revenue deficit is phased out and all what you borrow uh, from the market that will directly go for financing capital expenditure so that's the narrative but this golden rule was taken away in the amendment to the fiscal responsibility and manage management rule which is the original rule 2004 was amended in 2018 and in the 2018 if you look into the clauses in finance bill you know financial bill you can see that uh, you know whatever amendments happen that that appear in the finance bill right if you look into the clauses related to the revenue balance you can see that there is a concept of elimination of that revenue balance that is no longer valid uh, in the frbm amended rules and also you must be remembering the debate uh, that which choice of deficit uh, you know it's relevant in the context of india uh, like frbm committee uh, there was a debate within that committee uh, you must be remembering its chairman was uh, dr nk singh and one of the members of frbm committee you know uh, dr arvind subramaniam he was our former uh, you know a chief economic advisor and uh, there was a tug of war between uh, you know the deficit concept what could be the ideal deficit that to be kept in as the operational parameter in the context of India. So Arvind Subramaniam was favoring primary deficit and by definition primary deficit is fiscal deficit minus interest payments. So his argument was that uh, we need to understand the current fiscal stance of the government without any legacy of you know the interest payments and also your interest rate is exogenous variable uh, so the, he was focusing on a primary deficit to understand the current fiscal policy stance of the government but uh, you know uh, uh, it was not well taken then he put a decent note and that you can read that's beautiful decent note is there in the frbm committee report and still you know india in india we keep fiscal deficit uh, you know as the operational deficit parameter uh, to understand the fiscal stance and take a look into the numbers uh, you know fiscal deficit for 2019-20 uh, you know it was actual it was 4.6 percent of gdp then in 2021 budget estimates fiscal deficit was 3.5 then as i mentioned in the revised estimates fiscal deficit has risen to 9.5 percent now we have to wait uh, and see uh, in the february budget you know what is the budget estimate uh, it was 6.8 but we have to wait and see uh, in the february budget whether the six and six point eight percent of gdp we could maintain during this year or uh, it will be above six point eight we have to wait and see now let's uh, let's have a look into revenue deficit numbers of course as i mentioned uh, it's ideal to phase out the revenue deficit like you know whatever you earn in revenue receipts that will finance the revenue spending but in the time of pandemic revenue spending is so crucial that's why if you look into the numbers of course we have in the actuals 2019-20 revenue deficit was 3.3 percent of gdp and if you look at the budget estimates of 2020 it was reduced to 
and uh, in the year of pandemic in the first year of pandemic you know if you see the numbers in the revised estimates revenue deficit has shot up to 7.5 percent but you know we can defend that number because revenue spending especially in health education these are very crucial in the time of pandemic you know so that 7.5 is welcome in the time of pandemic and uh, what we visualized is 5.5 percent 5.1 percent uh, to be uh, you know uh, uh, to be the budget estimates and uh, but we have to wait and see in the next budget whether we are able to maintain to that 5.5 whether we are able to reduce the 7.5 to 5.1 uh, we have to wait and see in the next budget now primary deficit it was uh, 1.6 in the 2019-20 budget it was reduced to 0 0.04 it is not reduced but what we thought that uh, in 2020 you know what we anticipated was 0 0.4 but of course it's an year of pandemic and primary deficit is also 5.9 but we perceive that we can reduce it to 3.1 but let's wait and see now in the time of pandemic um, you know extreme precaution need to be taken when we measure deficits uh, it may be incorrect to think that cyclically neutral fiscal deficit is a better measure of deficit because you know it is important to analyze whether these disruptions or downturns are just cyclical in nature or just transitory or whether it leads to uh, you know permanent scars or whether it permanently leaves a scar or depresses the level of output and employment so if that drop in gdp from the trend growth uh, if, if it's a permanent drop rather than a temporary deviation then it is incorrect to assume that an upturn in the business cycle can eliminate the cyclical part of the deficit and you know uh, such things cannot happen if there is no return to economic growth cycle to prior trend growth path and in such circumstances the revenue buoyancy could remain below the prior potential level uh, you know that's why in an economic downturn fiscal consolidation is little tricky because if the fiscal consolidation happens through uh, you know not through the revenue buoyancy but through you know expenditure compression that can affect the quality of fiscal consolidation so if we are worried about a bad equilibrium of rising debt and deficits then it's better to have a contingent fiscal rule that is to keep the fiscal rules but not to use it in the time of pandemic and uh, you know we can argue that a steady steady fiscal consolidation can be detrimental in the time of crisis and of course this uniform and rigid fiscal rule that not only undermines the fiscal autonomy of the states that would also result in you know your public developmental expenditure compression uh, in order to comply with the numerical threshold ratios of deficit now let's have a look into the sources of financing of deficit in the union budget 2021 uh, you know if you look at uh, the numbers gross market borrowing that's a dominant source of financing deficit in india it is around 68.9 percent of the total borrowings if you take a look into the union budget documents and another major source is nssf that is your national small savings fund that constitutes around 26 percent of the total borrowings then uh, the deficit that you incur through off budget borrowings that is through the public sector enterprises that is not a part of fiscal deficit you need to construct public sector borrowing requirement uh, in order to capture that off budget uh, borrowings you know public sector borrowing requirement is a concept which takes into account of the general government level deficit in the sense you incorporate national provincial and you know the third year the local governments and also incorporates the public sector deficit so that's a wider concept in order to study the macroeconomic impact you know in terms of coverage public sector borrowing requirement is the ideal concept of deficit uh, 
but we have not yet constricted this PSBR data because of lack of a cons because of the constraints in the data itself. In the sense, we don't have any uh, clear data about intra-public sector borrowing requirements, transactions. We don't have the data ready at the third year, so there are a lot of limitations. So we have to wait for this PSBR. And uh, right now, extra budget borrowings are kept in an annexure in the union budget documents. Okay. Now, uh, you know, if you look at the union budget 2021, uh, creating fiscal space for economic stimulus package was crucial. Uh, but in the time of revenue uncertainties, uh, how can you enhance the fiscal space? And uh, Union Budget 2021 announced asset monetization program to generate revenue proceeds. It's like a kind of privatization. The revenue shortfalls of the tax and non-tax revenue were quite significant. And uh, if you look at the disaggregated analysis, we can see that Fiscal slippage from disinvestment proceeds is the highest. Uh, like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, even if it's a simple ratio of B to RE, budget estimates to revised estimates, if you take a look, then the fiscal marksmanship ratio that was highest for the disinvestment proceeds. So we, our aspiration and the reality regarding the asset monetization or the disinvestment proceeds or the privatization, there's a huge gap. Even if a moment we think that, okay, we, will, we are going to get what we aspire for, what we have done in the budget estimates, in the BE, even then, the entire asset monetization sale proceeds, what we anticipate, comes around 5% of the entire receipts budget. So that's, that's a way. The fiscal space, even if we can increase in the revenue uncertainty, the era of uncertainty, that was just you know in the entire revenue uh, receipts if you look at the capital receipts and the revenue receipts in that entire revenue receipts budget it is only around five percent of the entire budget entire revenue budget so that's the fiscal space what we perceive that we can enhance through asset monetization but we have seen that the picture is very mixed uh, that uh, things are not happening not picking up the way we anticipated now, economic stimulus packages, you know, it has two components if you look into it meticulously. And one component focuses on the measures that relate to instantaneous economic firefighting. And the other component pertains to long-term policy imperatives. And on the monetary policy front, as I mentioned earlier, Reserve Bank of Government has done a heavy lifting. Uh, like consecutive lowering of the repo rates and uh, they kept the repo rate constant since f October 2019 along with the liquidity infusion programs and here you know the monetary fiscal linkages are very crucial to catalyze your demand but you know the question is as I mentioned earlier how long you can uh, you know uh, push without going ahead with normalization procedure because this today's excess liquidity into the system that carry a high social cost uh, it's it's like we have a good reason to worry that this excess liquidity it, that can also be funneled into financial speculation and it can also lead to an a, a climate of increased economic uncertainty and it can also lead to, you know, discourage consumption and investment in the long term, which is required for the economic recovery. And whether we get into that sort of a liquidity trap uh, with, you know, huge increase in the money supply, but interest rate remaining, uh, you know, uh, what you call non-effective. And, uh, you know, these are matters of concern. The moment we talk about, you know, interest rate being the prime driver for economic growth recovery I mean, it could, because it's not one-to-one -one. interest rate triggering the growth process that's not one-to-one -one. the macroeconomic channels in which that happen you know we need to take a look into that now let's have a quick look into the numbers policy repo rate is four percent RBI has retained that even in the recent monetary policy committee meetings but we cannot do that you know uh, uh, you know, uh, 
we may have to increase that but it may hurt the growth recovery process in the sense you know the investment will become costlier but if we keep the rates lower financialization of savings is not happening the way we intend so there is a policy dilemma over that and this new monetary policy framework that is only focusing on price stability but there are other elements to it and right now in the era of pandemic rbi has got into many other components of policy as well in terms of liquidity infusion but otherwise the price stability and uh, the financial stability that's a matter of urgent concern uh, you know as far as rbi is concerned okay now uh, you know we have not done any major fiscal stimulus uh, announcements the v treasury a uh, secretary janet ellen has done in the context of us there was no huge fiscal stimulus programs to stimulate demand it was all targeted in nature our mini budget series which were announced since march 2020 if you look at uh, they were all focusing on very targeted kind of economic stimulus programs in the recent union budget we have focused on the capital infrastructure and there is an increasing recognition of the fact that public investment has suffered from fiscal consolidation just look at the numbers uh, you know in, uh, in the state budgets uh, you know the we can see that the state budgets and even the center budget they have over adjusted to fiscal rules by capital expenditure compression but the empirical evidence suggests that public investment is one of the crucial determinants of strengthening private corporate investment so in the context of emerging economies if the capital expenditure compression happens that is that fiscal that kind of fiscal discipline is not growth enhancing at all we have seen that the fiscal consolidation is not growth enhancing at all that's why the narrative in the economic survey uh, of 2021 and also in the union budget 2021 the narrative uh, you know which was backed by finance minister nirmala sitaraman is that deficit is good and don't fear deficit in the time of pandemic and we don't have any clear empirical evidence of you know financial crowding out that's happening uh, through the interest rate mechanisms and deficit is no longer the villain in increasing the interest rates because interest rate determination is based on a formula based thing that policy rate is determined through inflation anchor which is 4% in our country and we have a uh, you know a band uh, which is plus and minus 2 so comfort zone for the inflation officially in india is uh, 6% okay and that's what we we are t- i am talking about is cpi inflation right now okay and we have inflationary expectations which is an unobserved variable but rbi has floated an expectation survey uh, to capture this unobserved variable and at another unobserved variable is your output gap and i mentioned in my last lecture that it's a very controversial kind of a concept the way uh, the methodology uh, you know the how we capture that unobserved variable of potential output there are matters of concern over that uh, the way we call the trend as the potential using econometric filters or a trend through the peak method that's another way in which we can capture you know potential output and it has to be an envelope concept so these are matters of concern but as romer pointed out uh you know there is no silver bullet to correct this unobserved variables there is no silver bullet and we are learning by doing and the methodology is getting improvised to capture this output gap and it is not helping uh, that in the context of emerging economies you know when business cycle is not predominant or it is not clear then fiscal policy and monetary policy acting as counter cyclical policy tools also you know is a matter of concern because we need to look into the structural reforms as well to deal with the pandemic and i will get into the details of the structural reforms uh, especially in the power sector in a moment uh, before that uh, let's take a look into the budget numbers to understand how union government spent uh, you know out of this 34.50 lakh crore that's the size of the budget 
and that that's a total size for 34.5 and uh, out of that 10% uh, constitutes defense 23 constitutes your interest payments around 12.25 is your food bill and uh, here you know food food subsidy it has increased because you know I, I mentioned that budget transparency process has incorporated a part of you know uh, previously done uh, what you call as off budget borrowings into this fiscal deficit that's why you can see the number shooting up from 3.8 percent in the 2020 budget estimates for the food subsidy to around 12.25 in the re in the revised estimates and uh, fiscal slippage is also a matter of concern and in the sectors like agriculture education energy and home affairs the slippage was the highest uh, so there are reasons for that we need to look into because budget credibility analysis of macro fiscal variables at the national and subnational governments that is very important you know why this fiscal forecasting errors are happening whether that's happening because of the bias randomness uh, or is it because of the variation and as i mentioned nipfp has done an uh, excellent study uh, it was led by our director Pinaki Chakravarti to look into this fiscal marksmanship and the fiscal forecasting errors and we identified that most of the parameters are okay because in the sense the reasons for the deviation was random which is beyond the control of the policymaker. but intergovernmental fiscal transfers grants especially uh, capital spending due to this consolidation programs and all and tax projections uh, you know that forecasting needs uh, the assumptions the improvisation and assumptions and all these three components suffered from some kind of bias in that uh, forecasting uh, so the errors happen due to bias now um, intergovernmental fiscal transfers I mentioned uh, you know uh, I, and also I mentioned that high fiscal deficit can be substantiated with you know uh, high uh, what do you call spending for the capital investment then it can be vindicated if from that perspective if you look at the way the center government has announced the last budget they have given importance to public health infrastructure and this Atmanipar Swast Bharat Yojana that had an outlay of 64,180 crore over for, that was envisioned for the next six years and it was announced as a centrally sponsored scheme but at the same time finance minister also announced a plausible con so convergence of the centrally sponsored schemes is very relevant this was also recommended by 15 finance commission uh, that they, they, they uh, you know table that report in the parliament in on uh, fe first february last year i mean this early this year first, first february 2021 so if you look at the finance commission report uh, you know there is a concern about increasing centrally sponsored schemes and there is a need to do a convergence of these schemes so the transition in the structure of the intergovernmental fiscal transfers from conditional grants uh, to unconditional grants in unconditional transfers in the sense that 41 percent of the tax pool uh, that is devolved down to the state governments based on a scientific formula it's a formula based transfers and i know that in the next lecture uh, in the next session professor pinaki our director will be uh, you know uh, taking the lecture on intergovernmental fiscal mechanisms and he will be talking about uh, this unconditional grants the criteria and the magnitude so i will be i will not be going into it in detail all what i want to highlight is the moment you get into the disaggregated analysis to understand if there is any increased centralization in the design of fiscal transfers my answer is no there is no increased centralization in the design of fiscal transfers in india because since 14th finance commission there is a transition that has happened from the conditional transfer to unconditional transfers and if you ask me then what is this centralization we are talking about that is exclusively within the intergovernmental transfers in the form of conditional grants which constitutes only 23 percent of the entire intergovernmental fiscal transfer so i will give you the numbers in the intergovernmental fiscal transfer unconditional tax transfer share is 42 percent 
goods and services compensation gst compensation is around 8% finance commission grants especially for the local governments grants and the revenue deficit grants right that constitute around 13.88% and now comes as i mentioned your conditional grants that that is a line ministries centrally sponsored schemes which constitute 23% and the rest of it the remaining part 4 to 5% is what is a fiscal transfer to the union territories in india uh, delhi jammu kashmir puducherry we have union territories so that 4 to 5% of that is so this is the uh, structure of intergovernmental fiscal transfers in india so you can appreciate that 42% is a scientific tax transfer based on conditional transfers and centralization has not happened uh, you know over the years you know you can see that the centrally sponsored schemes that is exclusively 23% it may may come down we have to wait and see in the uh, you know february budget so in the time of revenue uncertainty high fiscal deficit announced in this union budget to 9.5 percentage that can be growth enhancing if it can catalyze public investment and if you can reduce output gap because you know strictly following the fiscal rules at 3% of gdp that is detrimental for the economic recovery because you know that as i mentioned earlier monetary policy stance has limitations in triggering the growth through the liquidity infusion and the policy rates you know keeping it low because today or tomorrow we have to increase the policy rates because there are many challenges the global challenges of you know fed reserve may go for increasing the rates we have the challenges from inflation shooting up mounting so there and financialization of savings another matter of concern so we may have to increase the interest rate in the near future uh, so keeping it low for growth recovery to uh, you know trigger the investment that cannot go on and on Uh, that's why you know fiscal dominance is very crucial for a sustained growth recovery so these are you know elements uh, which are related to the instantaneous uh, uh, what do you call the uh, you know what do you call the counter cyclical policy elements but as i mentioned cyclicality is not the entire thing you need to get into the uh, structural reforms as well because this crisis gives us opportunity to look into the structural of uh, factors as well and what are the major structural reforms that is happening in the context of pandemic in india one is in the power sector next is in the farm sector but of course we have repealed those and there was a huge cry for the uh, what do you call the minimum support price but the question is whether we can distort the price markets uh, by supporting minimum uh, giving minimum support price to a few selected crops whether we are uh, you know arguing that uh, you know in india the farmers have to go for only paddy and wheat and some crops which are uh, you know supported by the government which government is doing a minimum support price are we then uh, getting into the decision making process of the farming sector related to the diversification of the crops which are very crucial for food security Uh, are we not supporting the mpc for all the crops whether we can we have the fiscal space to go for all these things so these are matters of concern the moment we talk about you know government designing minimum support price and uh, through price mechanisms intervening in the price mechanisms like there are two prices right market price and government price whether we can do that or whether we should be focusing on income transfers rather than through pricing through income transfers whether we can uh, correct what has happened in the farmers farming sector whether we can support farmers we need to wait and see what the government uh, narrative is because you know income versus price there is lot of discussions what could be the narrative in which we can do a structural reform in the farming sector in the agriculture sector to support farmers uh, you know npc to the limited crops that can distort um you know we have to wait and see uh, what is happening now the power sector that is also you know if the picture is not that great in the sense we supported the power sector through a tripartite agreement between ministry of fine ministry of power uh, state governments and discom companies that is a distribution power distribution companies 
power distribution companies are in you know a perennial loss eternal loss so we need to support this distribution companies how to do that so we floated non slr bonds statutory liquidity ratio so non slr bonds and that was guaranteed by state governments and it has deteriorated the state finances but at the same time if you look at the parameters financial parameters and the operational parameters which they are supposed to uh, you know uh, correct if you look at that indicators uh, in the data that that data is given in the dashboard of ministry of power uh, in that uh, website that's only source of data for this uh, you know power sector reforms and its efficiency parameters we have looked into that in an ipfp you can see that paper you know recently published by apw also we have seen that the picture is mixed across state states in india some some states are doing very well in terms of financial parameters there are three important financial parameters one is tariff revision second is you have to reduce the aggregate technical and commercial loss to at least minimum at least 15% you know uh, because we know that we cannot reduce it to zero but you minimize it to 15 and then the gap between aggregate cost and aggregate revenue that gap is also widening it is not zero so financial parameters are not okay and operational parameters you know that is mainly about your power sector infrastructure uh, you know that is also not completely uh, you know corrected like uh, distribution uh, form of metering smart metering segregation of you know uh, your uh, uh, grid into commercial and uh, you know household purposes smart metering all these indicators if we look into the picture is mixed you have not gone for an efficient uh, operational efficiency and uh, in our country electricity generated is sufficient enough to uh, you know support the unconnected households but that production is not enough distribution companies have to perform well but those kind of you know structural reforms that is not it complete we are into the process and state governments are supporting it in the form, in in the process in turn state government uh, finances are getting deteriorated so that's one of the you know important area which we need to give emphasis and you know what has happened in the time of pandemic in the debt deficit dynamics you know and there was a narrative that um, it is based on the performance that you give the extra borrowing capacity uh to the uh, you know state governments in the sense government of india increased the borrowing limit of the state governments from 3% to 5% of gdp based on the performance related indicators and power sector reform at the state level is one of the criteria to avail this extra borrowing so efficiency parameters of the power sector is important but in our analysis as i mentioned state wise differentials in the financial and operational parameters is very huge and aggregate technical and commercial loss uh, you know it should have been 15% uh, you know but that is still on an average if you look at that is that stand at 26.15% and uh, average cost of supply and average revenue realized sorry realized that gap is also very huge that is widening and these operational parameters also indicate widening inefficiencies across states in power infrastructure so we have to go towards a just transition you know as envis- envisioned by the glasgow meetings you know the climate change commitments but this just transition from the f- fuels uh, you know f- um, uh, fossil fuels towards the you know using non fossil fuels for the energy sector energy infrastructure you know we have to take it uh, you know seriously this power sector reforms because power of power for all that is the you know prime objective of all these reforms but that's not happening uh, even after we supported you know it's a kind of a moral hazard because it's a tax payers money how many times we can do this recapitalization of the power sector it's it also creates moral hazards in the context of uh, you know indian economy uh, you know i think i will stop here because we have reached 3 pm already uh, so now the floor is open if you have any questions uh, related to the uh, you know the uh, uh, the components of my lecture regarding the economic stimulus packages uh, 
regarding the levels of deficit and the financing pattern of deficit and what are the ways in which the fiscal rules needs to be reconsidered given the limited uh, you know capacity of monetary policy in triggering the growth upturn uh, regarding any of these segments of my lecture if you have any doubts you know i'm open um, to answer your questions and over to you dr pascal uh, thank you so much <laughs>